Good morning. Welcome to Chapter 32, Non-Destructive Examination. So let's first discuss what is non-destructive examination. When we talk about non-destructive, we mean we are not going to destroy the part in order to look at it. Okay. So what's the number one type of non-destructive examination that is used? Give up. Visual examination or VT. Okay. All right. So when we talk about non-destructive examination, if we look at this little chart here, they're saying indication detected. When they say indication, that is, oh, we see something. It can be good and it can be bad. Okay. So one would be whether it's a false indication or a relevant indication. If it's a false indication, maybe, oh, it looked like this. Oh, but it's not. Okay. A relevant indication would mean, oh, there's something there. We need to look at it further. And we're going to evaluate it for acceptance criteria in accordance to that code or standard. Okay. Is it relevant? Is it non-relevant? If it's non-relevant, it means it is under um, the size that it should be, or I should say it's less than um, the criteria. So it makes it non-relevant and means we can accept the weld. But if it exceeds that coder standard, it becomes a defect and it rejects the weld. All right. Now, when we look at visual examination, we can also use different tools to examine the work that we're doing. OK, the first one we can use is a depth gauge. We can also look at convex convexity of fillet welds um, is even uh, convexity of our groove welds, whether we have excessive reinforcement. And I'll bring in some of the tools for you guys to check out. And it makes it a little bit easier to determine what we're looking at. OK, uh, the first type of oh, I should say the second type of non-destructive examination we're looking at is PT. Anybody think? Die penetrant PT. And what it uses is it's called capillary action. Uh, just think about if I had two pieces of material that came off the saw, and it makes it really difficult to separate them because of that liquid in between, because it gets drawn up into that little space. Well, that's exactly how dye penetrant works. It gets drawn up into these little spaces. Okay, so let me tell you how it works, and then you'll go, oh, okay. So we have a cleaner, a penetrant and a developer. So I think in this one, so we clean it. We want to clean it as best that we can. We want to make sure there's nothing there that can give us a false indication, okay? And then we're going to apply the penetrant, okay? And we're going to allow it to dwell for a certain amount of time in accordance with what the manufacturer says for that particular material, okay? And then we're going to clean it off. We don't want to overly clean it. We're just going to clean it so that we can see any indications. And then we're going to put this developer on it. And the developer in the past had been flour and chalk, but now it's like this powdery stuff, okay? And this powdery stuff allows the penetrant that was stuck in any type of uh, crevice or hole to be sucked up and to be seen, okay? That's really what it does. It sucks up the uh, from the developer, okay? Now, this is important. Please remember this. Dwell time. Dwell time is the total time penetrant is in contact with the component surface, including application and drain times. This is important to remember. Okay. Now, we can use dye penetrant in, with many different types of materials, including glass and plastic. Okay. And what they have is different size uh, penetrants that will go into smaller areas or bigger ones. Okay, so let's just look at steel welds. Okay, so this is what I probably see lack of fusion and porosity, and all of them cracks and fatigue cracks. Okay, and these are different types of dye penetrants. We have water washable, post emulsifiable, and solvent removed. The most common is water washable because we can just rinse it off. Other ones actually require solvents. Okay, so it's giving us a dwell time of 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 7 minutes, okay? So 
it tells us how long it needs to stay there. Okay, so this is exactly how it works. The dye penetrate gets stuck in these little crevices, okay? And we wipe the top of this dry, and then we stick the developer on there, and that developer <laughs> sucks up any of the penetrant in that little crack, and it gives us an indication. Pretty cool, right? So what can we see with dye penetrant? Here it is. We can only see things that are open to the surface. We can't see anything that's very deep. So that means, yeah, we'll probably see a crack on the surface. If we see small dots or things like that, well, we're going to see what? Porosity and sometimes incomplete fusion. Otherwise, we might not be able to see what we're looking for because it has to be open to the surface for us to catch it. All right, so the next one. The next one is magnetic particle or PT. What happens is, is they put a magnetic powder down and they have what is called a yolk and the yolk comes across it, okay? And we're able, and the magnetic uh, iron filings get stuck in the little cracks or crevices and gives us a discontinuity, okay? Seems like we're missing something, I guess not. Okay, so really, in order for us to use MT or magnetic uh, testing, we have to be able to magnetize the part, which means what? Some materials can't be magnetized. Okay? And in most MT, it's also, the magnetization is also created into a straight line. That means if I have a discontinuity that's going in the same direction as my lines of flux, I'm not likely to see it. Okay? So we have to go um, across it. So that means we have to move around um, the magnet in order to see it. Okay? So ultimately what happens is, is that when we magnetize something, so we say this is a north and a south, and we magnetize and it goes across. Now, if there's a crack or some sort of defect, what happens is it makes a north and a south and another north and a south, which means these areas start to repel itself and suck in in the discontinuity and we're able to see it. Kind of cool, right? Now there's circular magnetization. Circular means circle, right? So we can also use what's called a prod, okay? And we're going to go in a circle around it. Or we can have, uh, put the part in the middle and go around it, okay? So there's many different ways to magnetize something, okay? So this would be longitudinal, long ways. And here's our yoke. And in some of the videos, you'll see that they're using a yoke. And that's the magnetization that's going to be here. And we're going to magnetize our piece below it. Same thing here. Here's our field. Okay. And here's our piece. All right. So for efficient coverage, regardless if we're using prods or not, it has to be crisscrossed. We have to cross across the well in order for it to catch. And we want to catch any type of discontinuity. If we only go in one direction, we're probably going to miss a lot of discontinuity. All right, ultrasound. Hmm, I know you guys are probably familiar with ultrasound. Um, if any of you have wives or girlfriends that have had a baby, okay? Now, I want you to think about it. What do they do before they put the ultrasound down? They put that jelly. Well, that jelly is really important. That jelly is called a couplant. That couplant allows the sound waves to actually go into the skin. We're going to use a couplant, same type of couplant, except this couplant allows it to go into the material that we're looking for. And this is one of the true volumetric types of NDEs. It means I can see the whole volume. I can see the left, right, up, down. It's just not a, a piece of paper, but I can give you a 3D view of what we're looking at, okay? So the basic equipment is, is that we have a little uh, piece, our transducer, okay? And some of them come back and they'll have the trans 
the both pieces, the tra the catcher and the pitcher in one area. So the waves come out, they come back, and it's caught in the same area. Well, when we look at it, it's brought onto a screen. Okay, the first up and down that we see that is called a pip, p i p, pip pip pip. Okay, and it allows us to sweep across something and tell us how far away it is and how deep it is. Okay. It's pretty cool. Okay, so these are longitudinal or straight waves. Okay, these are shear waves. So this means I can go up and down, and really what happens is, is we're looking at how long does it take for this sound to come back up. So we're going to start here, and the sound takes this long. But when we hit a discontinuity, the sound either takes longer or shorter amount of time to come back, which means it shows us an area of discontinuity, whether we're using a shear wave or a straight beam. Okay, So we're able to you know, look at both sides or all of these different ways to be able to find a defect. And we have to go through the whole entire face in different areas to make sure that we're not missing anything. Okay. RT. This is my favorite. And pretty much what happens is, is we put a film behind a piece of material, maybe a piece of pipe, and we have a radiation source. A radiation source can be gamma rays or x-rays. And we'll get to that in a second. And what happens is when we turn that radiation source on, this plate right here will block some of the radiation that's going to hit the film. The areas that it does not block will leave a lighter piece, just like an x-ray that we do for our bones. Okay? It gives a density. All right. Now we can also have distortion if we're not really parallel with what we're doing. Okay, so it's really important as a technician when you do X-rays that you're parallel with what you're doing. Okay. Now we're going to look at X-ray machines. X-ray machines require volts. Okay. So we're talking about kilovolts here. So how much kilovolts can I put into it? Or how far I need to see. Okay, so maximum would be 2,000 kilovolts, and I would need to be able to go through eight inches of steel. Okay, so we're able to um, do that. But remember, our limitation is we have to have electricity for X ray machines. All right, now radioisotopes or gamma rays. This is a different type of radiation source. These means these are radioisotopes. Iridium-192, Silicium-137, and Cobalt-60, okay? So there's no on-off for this. What happens is they're shielded in a piece of lead, and when we need to um, take that quote-unquote camera out, it's reeled out to where it needs to be, and they open up that radiation source for a period of time and for it to uh, put onto a piece of film. Now, if we look at some of these, it's saying how far. So cobalt 60 will go through between 2 and 9 inches of material. Okay, so we have to think about this. You know, do we need something that is going to be portable? And when we talk about radioisotopes and gamma rays, these are the most portable. We don't need electricity for these, but the downside is we cannot turn it off. All right. IQI, Image Quality Indicator. A lot of people think it's for the size of our, uh, uh, come back, from the size of our indication, but it's not. What it does is actually the image quality. If I don't have a particular quality of the image, how do I know that I'm correctly determining whether this is a good weld or a bad weld? Okay. So what happens is, is there are many different charts okay, that show, and we have to be able to see a particular hole in a particular x-ray. So we use IQIs all the time in every single shot. We need to make sure that we are looking at the radiograph correctly. Okay? 
So it says, how much can I use? What IQ I, sh I should use and what IQ I, I should be able to see. Okay. All right. All right. So what they call is a shim sock stock. What happens is, is that here's my IQI, or they also call it a penny. It has to be the, uh, sitting at the same height that my weld is. Okay, So the top of my weld is here so that the back part of my shim or my IQI should be right here in order to make sure that I have the correct thickness of material, the same thickness of my weld in order to make sure that I have the correct quality of the film. Okay. Now we have single wall and double wall. Okay. We're talking about pipe. When we talk about or even plate, we're normally going to use a single wall because for a piece of plate we can put it right behind it and we can take and put a source. Okay. If I have something that's movable or I can get into, I'm going to put my film on the interior of the pipe and shoot towards it. But what happens when I have a pipe that I can't get into? They don't even show it. So we would actually have to put the film right here and shoot through both walls. This would be a double wall. Okay. This one here, electromagnetic induction. It's not used as much as we think. Okay. So they can also call this eddy current. Okay. So what they're using is an electromagnet, same kind of thing. And what happens is, is it changes the current if there's a defect in our material. So what happens is, is they take this huge coil and they put the material through it. Okay? A lot of times we're going to see this more in production, like when they do production of pipe, because they put the pipe through there. And if there's any type of indication, the gauges move and tell us that there's a problem. Okay? So this would be it, something like this. Here is my magnetization. And here's my tube. Okay. All right, last one, I think. Hydrostatic testing. Hydro, water. Okay, so a lot of times we're going to do hydrostatic testing of cylinders. We need to make sure that it is strong enough. Okay, but we have to be careful when we do this, otherwise, we can collapse it once it's drained. All right, let's stop here.